John 4, verse 24 will be our passage today. This is the word of Christ, Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman, and he tells her, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible is a lot of things, but it is certainly a book about worship. It's a book that describes who we worship, how we're supposed to worship, and what worship is. Worship is probably the most important thing about you. How you worship defines who you are. It illustrates what you think about God and about Christ. You can learn more about somebody by their life of worship than you can probably by any other feature. Worship is what separates you from non-Christians. Worship is what separates the good angels from the fallen angels. Worship is something uniquely given to those that love God. Listen, it's impossible for a non-Christian to rightly worship. I was listening to NPR one morning and I I heard some atheist yelling and and screaming. I repeat myself, I guess. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) And he was, this is this guy who travels around the world debating Christians and making the point that the atheists can do everything that Christians can is the main point of his argument, that Christians are responsible for the evils in the world, but atheists, all the good things in the world come as much from atheists as they do from Christians. And he gives this challenge. He says, uh, and it wasn't even a talk show, it was the morning show, but he, he gives a challenge to the listeners to call in. He says, I defy any of you to call in and tell me a single virtuous act that an atheist can't do. And I almost got in a car accident. I was yelling at the radio, worship. (laughs) That's what you can't do. That's what the atheist cannot do is he cannot worship. Yes, if the height of virtue was was loving your, your neighbor and the height of virtue was giving to the poor, then yes, I grant that atheists can be just as benevolent as Christians, but that's not the height of virtue. The greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. The greatest act of worship is to do just that. There's nothing more virtuous than worship. Now obviously non-believers do worship, but they don't worship rightly. They don't worship virtuously. You know, as I mentioned earlier, good angels and bad angels, that's the distinction between them. Fallen and angels refuse to worship. Righteous angels, they do worship. You see them in Isaiah chapter 6 singing. You see them in Revelation singing. In fact, they're singing the same song in both places. Angels love to worship, except the fallen angels who refuse to bow the knee. And the same thing is true for us. And listen, the angel illustration helps us realize that what separates true worship from false worship, it's not knowledge about God. It's love for God. Fallen angels know everything about God. Fallen angels know the truth about Christ. Fallen angels know that Christ was the Savior, God in human flesh, crucified on the cross, resurrected on the third day. Fallen angels understand that. What separates true believers from non-believers is not knowledge about God. It's not some intellectual assent or intellectual belief that yes, Jesus is true and yes, the Bible is true. That does not equal saving faith. You know what marks saving faith out? Worship. Love for Christ. And of course, worship, the most basic definition of worship is how Your knowledge about God intersects with your love of God and overflows into every area of your life. That's true worship. You take the invisible attributes of God and you make them visible to the world by how you respond to them, by how you sing about them, by how you live in light of them, by how the the knowledge of the attributes of God impacts your heart and causes you to overflow in love to God. This is why singing is the most obvious act of worship because, I mean, look at how concrete that is. You think of God's sovereignty or God's love and it impacts you and you love him because of those things and it affects you by, by singing with a loud voice about the greatness of them. 
This is why we, we don't sing with chants. We don't have memorized formulas. Because we're letting the knowledge of God hit our hearts and overflow in love. But it's not, of course, just singing is not the only act of worship. How you live your life. The New Testament has more to say about the overflow of God's love into your life than it does into your, your songs. Worship is described as serving other people. It's described as serving in the church. It's described as, as sacrificial living. The New Testament describes your own sanctification, laying down your own life as a living sacrifice, which is your acceptable act of worship. When you love Christ, everything you do is worship in as much as it connects back to your love for Christ. Now, as I mentioned, non-Christians, they too worship. They just don't worship rightly because they don't worship Christ. They worship themselves. Everything they do connects back to themselves. Or maybe they worship the government. It is the, the, the cause for, you know, the healing for all evils in the world. Maybe they worship their planet. Maybe they worship ideology. Maybe they worship all kinds of things, really. They just don't worship Christ. This is Paul's point in Romans 1. That non-believers know the truth about God. Again, it's not knowledge. They know the truth about God, but they suppress it. They reject it. They push it deep down inside of them. And then they swap it out, exchange it, get rid of the truth about God and replace it with some kind of idol that they make. Fasten a crocodile or something, some kind of idol, some kind of reptile is Paul's phrase in Romans 1. And then you worship that. You make something and you worship it, preferably an animal of some sort. And you think, oh, those Romans just worshiping idols. The world's not much different today, is it? People worship the planet today. They reject worshiping God and replace it with worshiping the planet, worshiping themselves, worshiping the animals. So of course they worship, but the point is they don't worship rightly because they don't worship the right God. It's not virtuous worship if it's not directed to the right God. But it's not enough True worship is not just seen in worshiping the right God. You can worship the right God and it not be true worship. Just ask Cain. Cain worshiped the right God, didn't he? But he worshiped him in the wrong way. Remember the Lord's rebuke of Cain? I've told you what's required of you. Bring a sin offering. It's crouching at your door. Go get it. You have to worship the right God in the right way for it to be virtuous worship. And you know what? The story of the Old Testament, the Israelites in the Old Testament, that demonstrates that even the right God in the right way is not sufficient to make true worship. They had the right God in the right way, but with the wrong motives. And God rejects their worship and says, your, your prayers, I'm closing my ears to them. Your feast days, your sacrifices are an abomination to me, God says, because your hearts do not love me. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your affections, God tells them. So true worship is seen in worshiping the right God in the right way with the right motives. That's acceptable worship. And that's what is reserved for believers. Here in John chapter 4, you have a conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. It's a well-known chapter. As I mentioned, I would love to spend weeks in this chapter, but I'm just going to focus on one verse for one morning. But the background here is Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and the Samaritans, it's important to understand who they were. They descended from Samaria back in the Old Testament. Israel split. Remember Solomon, David, and Solomon reigned over all of Israel. After Solomon died, Israel split between Judah in the south. That's where the line of David went. That's where Jerusalem was. That's where the temple was. That was Judah in the south. The other 10 tribes in the north. They didn't have Jerusalem. They didn't have Mount Zion, those 10 northern tribes. So they made their own headquarters up in Samaria. They dropped the name Israel. They called themselves Samarians. They were Samaria. And they ruled there for hundreds of years until the Babylonians threw them out. And the Babylonians exiled everybody from Samaria, but they left the poor they left the lame, they left the disabled, they left the weak, they left the unemployed, they left the beggars, they left the, the, the lowest part of the social class, they left them there. They didn't want to bring them to Babylon, so they left them in Samaria. And those people went up to the hills and lived in the hills for hundreds of years. They developed their own culture there, their own nation there, their own really ethnicity there. They descended from Israel, of course, 
But 500 years between the exile and 2 Kings 17 is where the Babylonians took the, the Samaritans away. That's 2 Kings 17. 500 years between there and John 4. 500 years. Think about how much drifts apart in 500 years. We're separated from England, our country is, by a couple hundred years. They're separated from Jerusalem for 500, well, even longer than that before, after their civil war. We're talking centuries here. These Samaritans have nothing to do with Israelites. They definitely don't worship at Jerusalem. They've never worshiped at Jerusalem. The Samaritans, they believe in the first five books of the Bible, which is the story of Moses. And remember, the, the story of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy ends before the Israelites cross into the promised land. So the Torah has nothing to do with Israel. That's how the Samaritans looked at it. It was all about God and how he wanted his people to live and worship in the temple. But it was completed before they had ever set foot in Jerusalem. So they love the first five books of the Bible. They don't love the books of Samuel because that's about David in Jerusalem. Bad. <laughs> They don't like kings because that's about their ancestors and how they got exiled, so that's off the reading list. Of course, the prophets have to go because that's all a rebuke of their ancestors and how they live too. So their Bible consisted of the Torah and one chapter of Judges. They love the story of Abimelech. Judges 9. You may not even know this story, but I'll tell you it right now. Gideon, you remember Gideon? With the fleece wet, fleece dry, that Gideon? Gideon had a son named Abimelech, humbly, which means my daddy is king. Gideon named his son. My daddy is king. <laughs> Go Gideon. When Gideon died, Abimelech becomes king, and he declares that the right place to worship is Mount Gerizim up in the northern part of Israel. And so the Samaritans love Abimelech. Now, Abimelech's story is a tragic ending. He gets his head crushed in by a rock lobbed by a woman off a ledge. That's how it goes when your name is Abimelech. <laughs> So the Samaritans like the first five books of the Bible. They like Judges 9. They were set up in the hills. Nothing to do with Judaism. Nothing to do with the Israelites. There they were. And they had no interaction with any Jews, really. You wouldn't walk through this part of the, the world, except if you're Jesus, who's taking a shortcut, which is actually longer, and that's complicated, to get from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem. He passes by this Samaritan woman. Now, a Jew would never have any talk, conversation with a Samaritan, of course, much less a Jewish male with a Samaritan woman. This is just unheard of. But Jesus talks to her. And she perceives that he's a prophet. Remember, she says, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet because he knew things about her. Again, I don't want to dwell on that. But she asks him a question. Remember, you're seen here, the Samaritan woman confronted with a Jewish man talking to her. This is the chance for a Samaritan to ask a, this Jewish prophet a question. She's only got one question. This is the question burning in the mind of every honest Samaritan. Are we doing this right? Should we be worshiping in Jerusalem or is it okay to worship up here? Should we be, I mean, the temple is down in Jerusalem. The Samaritans hated that place. It was built by Herod, the temple. Could you imagine being a Samaritan and looking at the Jews worshiping in a temple built by some Roman king? I mean, the whole thing's appalling to them. Well, that's where the Jews worshiped. And now she has a conversation with this Jewish prophet. And she asks him, should we worship in Jerusalem or should we worship at this mountain up here? At least she asks a good question. I get so bugged by the Sadducees in Mark's gospel that waste their questions on silly ones. <laughs> she asks a great question. How would you answer that question? And I bet you've been asked it too. I bet maybe you're at your daughter's soccer game and one of the other parents comes up to you and says, Sir, I perceive that you're a pastor. Where should I worship? Or maybe you're not a pastor and maybe it goes like this. You're at work and somebody new comes up to you at work and says, I've just moved here. I just finished my time in Okinawa and now I'm stationed at the Pentagon and I'm a Christian. I've heard you're a Christian. Everybody says you're a believer. Where should I worship? How do you answer that question? 6911 Braddock Road, Springfield, Virginia, 22152 or whatever the zip code is. <laughs> EmmanuelBible.Church, that's where you worship. It's so easy to focus on the address and the physical presentation of worship, isn't it? Somebody asked you where to worship, you would probably answer that way. But look how Jesus answers in verse 24. 
He says, God is spirit. God is spirit. Now, this is an unusual claim for Jesus. I mean, first of all, it is a Trinitarian statement. You have to think about who's speaking here. That God the Father has sent God the Son to earth, put on human flesh, is dwelling among us, and he's proclaiming that God is also spirit. So you have a father, son, spirit relationship. The father sends the son. The son proclaims that God is spirit. This is a Trinitarian conversation. But it's, it's even more profound than that because what Jesus is saying here is that God by nature is spirit. God by nature is father, which means by nature he's a life giver. God by nature is son, which means by nature he glorifies himself the Son being the image of the Father, and God by nature is spirit. It's fitting for God to be the life giver. It's fitting for God to be self-glorifying, and it's fitting for God to be a spirit. It's, It's all part of God's nature. God is not by nature flesh. You by nature are flesh. God by nature is not. It means God's not physically located anywhere. Part of you being a person is that you're physically located somewhere. You learn this at a young age when your mom yelled at you, I cannot be in two places at one time. And you said, I'm pretty sure you can, mom. No, you find out, no, it's all illusions. Moms cannot be in two places at one time. But God can because God doesn't have a body. God is spirit. He's omnipresent because he's omniscient. He knows all things everywhere. He's omnipresent. You're not going to find, to find God, you don't go, past the third star, second black hole on the left, turn right around the third constellation, and there he is. He exists independent of his creation. He made his creation. He doesn't live in his creation because he's spirit. Now, you also are spirit, but your spirit is not eternal going backwards. Your spirit is eternal going forward, but you're not eternal going backwards. So when you were knit together in your mother's womb, your body was, was knit together, you became flesh, you became body, the cells dividing human life body, your spirit joins there, your spirit is created by God there. So you come into this world being both flesh and spirit. Your spirit is dead in sins and trespasses, nevertheless it is part of your nature. But think of the connotations of being flesh. Being flesh is certain desires, food, intimacy, sleep. Those desires in and of themselves are not bad. Of course, being in fallen flesh, we morph those desires and we change them and we use them for sinful reasons. That's why they're called fleshly desires. That doesn't have a good connotation to it, does it? (laughs) I've just got these fleshly desires. That doesn't sound good. And of course, those desires in and of themselves aren't evil. They're given by God. They existed in the pre-fallen world, but our fallen nature corrupts them and makes them wicked. Understand that they are foreign to God. God doesn't sleep or eat because he's spirit. Now, being flesh is not contrary to God's nature. It's not against God's nature because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, takes on flesh. He takes on an additional nature that doesn't violate his nature. It's just an addition. So the God man is here, both spirit and flesh. And that's why this is such an incredible statement. The God man declares that God himself is spirit. Think about the implications of this. It affects how you worship. You know, if you don't have God as spirit, you worship God in physical ways. And so it becomes so important which mountain you go to, to Jerusalem or or Mount Gerizim. It becomes important. Do you go to to this building to worship or that building? What clothes do you wear to worship? What ritual, the chants that people memorize? They don't even know the words, but they have these physical manifestations and physical uh, They do physical things as their act of worship with the right color windows and the right color tiles and the right building facing the right direction with the right statues in it. That becomes worship if God's not spirit. In Los Angeles, the church that I was at one year, we saw all the housing prices around our church just skyrocket, double in almost a year, triple by a few years after that because a few doors down from the church was this Buddhist temple. And the Buddhist temple received some certification from the, the people that do this kind of things, declaring it to be the, the second most holy Buddhist temple in the country after one in New York. 
And so the housing prices shot up because there was some distance from the temple that was considered holy land for, for Buddhists, and so they wanted to live there. And so it became, the, all the houses in the neighborhood became this bidding war as the neighborhood turned almost entirely Buddhist. And they would grow plants at their houses, and they would sell the plants in their driveways because they were plants that were grown on a holy ground. They would make statues, and they would sell them. Even yard, Not all of them idols, not all of them designed for worship, even just like yard ornaments, like yard gnomes kind of thing, would be for sale in the driveways because they were made on this, this holy ground. And even people in those kind of religions would say that it's spiritual. The temple itself has these horns on top of it facing do north and do south, I believe, to catch the good spirits that move in one direction and let the bad spirits that go the counter direction pass over. See, isn't that spiritual? And the answer is no, it's not, because when you say that God is spirit, you don't mean that he's like the, the jet stream moving in certain directions. He's not sanctifying certain pieces of ground. And Christians fall into the same trap. You know, we call Israel the holy land because Jesus walked there. Well, did it sanctify the ground? I mean, what do we mean by that? God is spirit means he doesn't dwell anywhere. Now, Jesus uses this to connect the answer to worship, meaning you don't worship in this temple or that temple, in this mountain or that mountain. That's not the point. The time is coming, Jesus says, meaning future time. Pentecost is coming when the Holy Spirit will come into the world and he says the time is coming. It's almost here now because Jesus is there now, but it's still a future time. He's pointing in the future where you won't care about this temple or that temple, this mountain or that mountain because you'll worship God rightly. His spirit will dwell inside of you. You want to worship God rightly. You worship God in keeping with his nature, which is spirit. And so he goes on to say God is spirit. And those who worship him must Worship, he says, must worship. This is essential. If you want to worship God, you must worship him in this way, in spirit and truth. These are not two different things. Maybe you've heard it said that there are two different ends of the pendulum, two different opposites. You worship God in spirit and you also worship God in truth. I've had people argue with, tell me that this is, from this verse, you deduce that churches should do contemporary music and traditional music. I see some people nodding their heads, others of you laughing. <laughs> I had people make this case to me that, that contemporary music is the spiritual stuff, because, you know, seven words and hands raised and you have a spiritual experience and traditional music is more, more truthy and more complex and so it's a balance between spiritual hands up and, and truthy, complex and you got both and that's how the church should be. I'm sure many of you heard that argument too. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not parachuting into the worship wars of 2002. <laughs> When he says you worship him in spirit and truth, even the way it's structured in the Greek, this is a singular statement he's making. It's a because, therefore. Because God is spirit, therefore worship him in spirit and truth, one thing. One preposition governs both of these nouns. It's not in spirit and in truth. It's in spirit and truth. In English, you would you wouldn't split your prepositions like that probably anyway unless you meant to say one thing. But in English, you'd probably even drop the and from the middle. If I said I had chickens in my house and in my barn, that would imply I have a house and barn both with chickens. But if I said I have chickens in my barn house, you would think, does this guy live in his barn? Or do you turn his house into a barn? Which is it? <laughs> That's the second way is the way Jesus says this. You worship God in spirit and truth. One thing. One thing, spirit and truth brought together. They're indivisible. They're not extremes that are assimilated. They're individual. Now, why does he say that? Why this time for this lesson? Well, this is an overflow of what he was teaching in John chapter 3. John 3 is before John 4. I went to seminary to learn that, and it was worth every penny. John 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus that you cannot see the kingdom of God unless the Holy Spirit causes you to be born again. You can't worship unless the Holy Spirit causes you to go from death to life. You are born spiritually dead. Even Nicodemus, the, the exalted Pharisee, is flesh and spirit, but his spirit is dead. Flesh only produces flesh. You need the Holy Spirit to make you alive, Nicodemus. You can't even see God's kingdom unless the Holy Spirit saves you. And Nicodemus's jaw drops open. Jesus says, how do you claim to be the 
the teacher of Israel and you don't know that you need the Holy Spirit to be spiritually alive. He leaves that encounter with Nicodemus. He's cutting through up in the hills now. He's talking to the Samaritan woman. And it's so fascinating that the Samaritan woman gets the same lesson the Jewish Pharisee gets. The exalted Pharisee, you need the Holy Spirit to see God. The Samaritan, the humble Samaritan woman, you need the Holy Spirit to see God. He's got to make you alive. He's got to save you. Your spirit is dead. The Holy Spirit through faith makes you alive. And he does so, by the way, through the washing of the word. This is how Paul says it in Titus. He saves us, not on the basis of deeds done in the flesh, but based on the washing of regeneration. In other words, the washing of the Holy Spirit. And the, and the I'm sorry, the washing of the word of truth and the cleansing of the spirit. The word and the Spirit combined to sanctify you and open your eyes to the truth. And that's coming from Ezekiel, who prophesies the new covenant. Back in Ezekiel, he says, the time is coming. The time is coming where the Holy Spirit will take you from death to life, and the Word of God will cleanse you. Romans 10, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can you call on someone you don't believe in? How can you believe in someone whom you haven't heard? How can you hear unless there's a preacher. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the words of Christ, the scripture. So the way salvation happens, you're confronted with the truth about God from his word, and which you don't believe, you reject, you suppress, and the Holy Spirit causes you to open your eyes and you come alive. And when you come alive, you worship. A baby is born and cries. A Christian is born and worships. You come into this spiritual world as a worshiper. It's through the word of God and the indwelling of the spirit. That's why it's spirit and truth. In fact, later on through the rest of John's gospel, Jesus is just going to call the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. He's going to drop the and himself and and make it... A description. He, the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I'm going to go away and I'm going to send you the spirit of truth. John 14, 17. John 15, 26. He just, it's John 16, 13. All those places, the spirit of truth. Two times in 1 John, he says the spirit of truth in reference to the Holy Spirit. Now there's a dispensational element here in the Old Testament. They did worship in the temple because the Holy Spirit did not indwell them. But they didn't, listen carefully, this is such an important distinction to understand the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did dwell in the temple, but not exclusively. He dwelt in the temple uniquely, but not exclusively. He dwelt in the temple differently than he dwelt everywhere else. And so you worship the temple differently than you would everywhere else. The temple is where the Holy of Holy was. The temple is where the high priest went once a year. The temple is where the sacrifices were brought. That was all happening at the temple. But you could worship anywhere, even in the belly of a whale, a la Jonah. The same thing is true in the New Testament. Do you have to go to church to worship? No. You can worship anywhere because God is spirit and his spirit is everywhere. You can listen. You can even worship God in traffic on 395. It's true. But do you need the church for worship in some sense? Absolutely. You don't worship God exclusively in the church. But you do worship God uniquely in the church. That's why the person who says, uh, I'm a Christian, I just don't go to church, but I can still worship God. Well, yes and no. Yes, you can still worship God. But no, you can't worship God fully. There's 47 one another's in the New Testament you can't do apart from the church. So yes, you do need the church, but not exclusively. This is all wrapped up in Jesus' point here. The true worship, it's not going to be on this mountain or that mountain. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll indwell believers. It'll be all over the world. There will still be locations to worship where believers are gathered, where two or more are together. The authority of Christ is in their midst, and you can worship him differently than you can by yourself. There is something unique happening in worship, but it's in corporate worship, but it's not exclusive. It's exclusive to believers, but not exclusive in the world. This is a contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. 
and why Jesus can point forward and say the spirit of truth will come. And those who have the spirit of truth will be pleasing to God. Now, the woman rightly understood that Jesus was talking about the coming of the Messiah. Remember her question? Do we worship on this hill or that hill? Jesus says, no hill, because God is spirit. You worship him in spirit and truth. Look at verse 25. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. She understood what he meant. She understood that he meant in the future, the Messiah, the Savior, will come and will do away with both of these hills. She got that. Isn't this such a surreal conversation, by the way? This woman is asking Jesus, where do we worship? And he says, the time's coming when the Savior will come and it won't matter. And she says, yeah, I, if only that Savior would be here. <laughs> and Jesus tells her, the one who's talking to you, that's him. Verse 26, he's here. Just then, the disciples, probably led by interrupting Peter, arrive and ruin the whole conversation. (laughs) I wish it would have gone on and on. The Spirit who gives love and life, that's the requirement for worship. God is a life giver because he's a father. He's a life giver because he's a son who lays down his life for ours. He's a life giver because he's a spirit who gives life. By saying this, that true worship happens, it must happen in spirit and truth. By saying this, as D.A. Carson says this, by saying true worship must happen in spirit and truth, quote, Jesus thus made true worship the exclusive privilege of those who experience regeneration. Apart from saving faith in Christ, there is no such thing as worship. And saving faith only comes from the indwelling of the Spirit. 1 John 5, 6, the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. The Spirit brings salvation, which results in sanctification, and so you are saved and sanctified by the Spirit and truth. The Word of God is the truth of God. The Spirit of God is the life-giving effect that causes the truth to come alive in your heart. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 is Paul's way of saying this, a critical verse. I don't want you to flip to it now because of time, but just jot this down. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God has chosen you for salvation by the Spirit through belief in the truth. God has chosen you for salvation by the Holy Spirit. That's called a genitive of means. He's chosen you for salvation by using the Spirit. That's the means by which he'll save you through Belief in the truth. He doesn't just say true worship is spiritual because that would leave out he's the spirit of truth. The word of God is truth and Jesus himself is truth and he points people to the truth and thus when the Holy Spirit saves a person, they have the knowledge of the truth. Another way of saying this, somebody can only worship that which they know. If you don't know God rightly, you don't worship him rightly. If you have a wrong understanding of God and you worship that element of God, you're worshiping God wrongly because you're worshiping an idol, really, a God that you made. And thus knowledge and love is another way of saying truth and spirit. You've got to know the right thing about God and love him. How do you know about, about him the right way? Through the word. And how do you love him? Through the spirit who indwells you. And so truth and spirit or knowledge and love make the essence of worship. Again, they're not divided, they're not extremes, they're one overflowing love in your life for the truth about Christ. When worship is directed towards Jesus, then those who've been saved by him recognize that he is the way and the truth. Do you understand how Jesus, the one who's saying this fulfills all these things? In John 2, Jesus declared that he was the true temple. They're concerned about this temple or that temple. And Jesus says, he's the temple. His body is what will be laid down. His body will be the focal point of worship. The church is his body. He is the temple. They're concerned about this mountain or that mountain. Hebrews chapter 12 says that you don't come to Mount Sinai where the law is given. You come not even to the Mount Zion in this world. You come to an exalted Zion, a better Zion. Jesus is the better mountain. He's the real temple. He's the real mountain. He's the real truth. He's the real life. He is the real resurrection. He describes all of these things as being himself. So when we worship Jesus, we're worshiping the one who is spirit, who is truth 
who is the temple, who is the mountain. Jesus brings all this together in his own body. What a contrast with false religion that has no transcendent temple, has no transcendent being that loved and lived and walked among us and yet is spiritual. Worship becomes chance. Worship becomes external expressions. But for the believer, it's not ritualistic. Even, I mean, think of the rituals we do have in church. Think of the ordinances Christ gave us. Just choose one right now, baptism. It's a physical act. You're baptized underwater. It's a physical act. But even your baptism underwater, it's demonstrating that before you touch the water, you first were baptized by the Spirit. This is all connecting back to the Holy Spirit saving us, bringing us into the church. It's possible there are people here today that have never been saved. And if that's true, that means you have never worshiped rightly. You've been passionate about things. You've been pursuing things. You've been passionate about other religions perhaps even, but you've never worshiped the right God in the right way with the right motives. But it's not impossible to do. If the Holy Spirit saves you, I pray this morning would be the day that you cry out to God and that you ask the Holy Spirit to change your life, that you place your faith in Jesus who died on the cross for your sins, and that you ask God to make you into a worshiper. Salvation is not just saving you from the judgment of God, it's saving you from the judgment of God and sending you out as a worshiper of Christ. The Holy Spirit will do this to you if you place your faith in him. Lord, we're thankful that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through you. We're thankful as Jesus, our Lord himself, said that no one can see the kingdom unless the Holy Spirit causes them to be born again. Lord, we're thankful for the sovereignty of the Spirit. We're thankful for the intimacy of the Spirit who dwells our hearts and causes us to walk with you. We're thankful for the love you've placed in our hearts for you and your word. We give you thanks for making us worshipers. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.